I'll say this, like, my, my, I get asked this question a lot because a lot of people think that, like, having been in meeting and come out of meeting, we would have kind of like a an adversarial stance toward it. Yeah. I don't have an adversarial stance towards the people. Yeah. But the theology sure. behind the, the, yep. the doctrine is what I have a, a kind of a problem with. The the gospel, whenever it actually opened up outside of the uh, the teaching that we had experienced our whole life, um, was really it was really powerful to to get to experience some of that. And so we started talking about it, and he said, "Well, the Bible says you're not supposed to do that." And I said, "Okay, where?" Mm -hmm. And he couldn't tell me. Yeah. And man, that was such a powerful moment because I'm like, now I get it because I see it in someone else. I knew it, it was there in me that I had an idea of who God was because of what I, what I was taught as a child. Mm -hmm. But the idea that I was taught about who God was is completely counter to who God actually is. Mm -hmm. Like we lost everybody. Yeah. Uh, like our entire community was gone. Mm -hmm. I remember people treated us like, like we had professed Satanism instead of just saying, hey, we just don't think this is what Jesus would actually want us to be living. Multiple times, we would see somebody start to walk across the room towards us, realize who we were, my mom and I, realize who we were, and turn around and walk the other direction. And the workers that, that, that spoke at the funeral, mm -hmm. they, the, the, the gist of their message was basically, if we all try hard enough, maybe one day, if we're lucky, we can make it to heaven too. We turn, some, we turn Jesus into somebody that he, he's not and he never yeah. was. And getting that first breath of fresh air of, of who Jesus actually is, like, there is no better feeling. If you have the true and perfect way, why would you be afraid to challenge that? Yep. And I think that the, whenever we get into the whole, why are, they not, why are they not questioning the truth? Why are, they, why are they afraid of people asking questions? I think it comes down to the workers have an element of control. Mm -hmm. with whenever people don't ask questions. We go and sit down with a brother worker. I won't tell you which one. You would probably know him if I told you. And he, he's still an elder brother worker. And I remember him telling me that I was not old enough to make that decision. And that was the end of that. And They have the final say. On whether or not I devote my life to Christ. Yeah. Yeah, which yeah. is like, what? Texas. We're heading over to visit with Cody. Uh, <clears throat> I think he left meetings when he was 19, born and raised. And uh, we visited a little bit on the phone. I, I He's got quite a story. And so I'm excited to visit with him and hear kind of how all that played out. Uh, if I remember right, his mom was involved in kind of leaving as a family. So uh, he didn't just leave on his own, but his his uh, his family kind of left together. Uh, but anyways, we will visit with him and uh, hear his story. Just pulled up, let's go. Say hi. Hey, man. hey how are you? Good. So beautiful. <laughs> That's okay, no problem. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So it's a beautiful little town you got here. Thanks, man. It's we, we really like it. So we moved here in 2020. Okay. But I mean in the summertime they have like concerts over there. Yeah. And yeah, you got the the front. Oh, it's awesome. Front row man. seat. So, so we've got a a really good coffee shop right there in that red building and then the best Italian food in the Panhandle right there, and some really good Mexican food right there. That's all so you need, right? We got good choices. <laughs> I saw the coffee shop out there because I already drank coffee, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good, but it looked like a cool place. Do they have, so that place is called Palace Coffee, and their motto is be kind and serve good coffee. Cool. Like, you can't have a better place than that. Yeah, but. that's cool. So yeah, this is Canyon. We. 
the only cobblestone streets still. Yeah, I mean that's the worst part about this town <laughs> is the the roads roads are bad, but my truck's got well, I'll need new tires pretty soon, but it's uh, yeah. going down the interstate just shakes like crazy oh, right now because my tires are not the greatest. Yeah, I get uh, that. So this feels pretty smooth. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so far. That. Yeah. So, well, I don't know a whole lot about your story. Man, um, so what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with, uh, let's start with your childhood. Um, you were born and raised, how far back does your family go going to meetings um, for I mean my mom's whole life um, some of my extended family still goes okay um, but my mom was there her whole life um, until we got out whenever I was a teenager um, my dad he never did until he married my mom and then um, so your mom joined like as a child as a child yeah, her, okay. so her parents yeah my, okay. my grandfather grew up in meeting. Um, and my my grandmother has been attending since they got married 55 years ago, 54 okay. years ago, something like so that. So you'd be probably like third generation? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and like I said, the majority of my extended family still still attends meeting. Yeah. So, so yeah, like I said, uh, we started, I grew up in New Mexico. Um, oh, what part? So we. I was actually born in Albuquerque. Okay. Um, and then we moved to Cimarron when I was five, and so and then I, I moved to Texas when I was twenty-two. Okay. Um, My so, brother lives in Albuquerque. So oh, really? I lived with him uh, right out of high school for a few months. Albuquerque is so, a good place, man. Uh, the, the crime level right yeah, now is pretty bad. Like I saw a, a picture on Facebook the other day, and it had a. a a picture of the mountains you know real yeah. pretty and it said albuquerque new mexico come for the green chili stay because your car got stolen <laughs> like it, it's funny stuff but yeah yeah so we moved up there um like i said we went to a meeting till i was in my like mid teenage years um and then we got out of that so you were you like full in pretty conservative liberal what would you say you were as far as on the meeting scale <laughs> so Actually, I was about as um, as bought in as I could be. Okay. Um, when when my mom told us that we were getting out, I remember being really upset with her. So your mom was kind of the one that led that for your family. Yeah. Um, so your a, dad what didn't go? So it's your mom and the kids. Yeah. So my dad would go with us because he want he just he wanted to go with us. Okay. My dad really didn't have a relationship with Jesus until he was until I was probably 21 or 22. I okay. baptized my dad when I was 21. So, oh, cool. Yeah, it was awesome. awesome. So, yeah, I mean, but ultimately, yeah, my mom, uh, I, I actually started asking my mom some questions about some different things that I had heard, and we can get into that through this conversation. But And um, that led to her asking some questions and then ultimately led to, to making the decision that it was healthier for us to to go somewhere else okay so okay we'll go into a little bit more detail on that process of leaving so <laughs> what were some of the questions that you asked and so i i had growing up i had three best friends okay. like one of them is still my best friend to this day um and none of them went to meeting okay and i had asked a worker a question and i said why aren't my friends gonna go to heaven Okay. And he gave me a really vague answer. Um, and so I asked my mom that. And apparently I was really, um, I remember being really upset, but my mom tells me that I was like crying, emotional. I remember feeling upset um, and, and being wondering why. And um, So did he confirm that they're not going to heaven? Was uh, he like, or was yes it just he didn't yeah, really give you anything? Yes and no. I mean, he told me basically the, the, the line of, they're lost and the they're not walking in the truth and that type of thing yeah. and um as a as a i was probably 12 13 years old at the time didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me yeah um and uh so that kind of started the process and then there were some other comments that it had come up through conversation with different workers and things and like i remember sitting in my in my living room one day and or one evening and listening to a conversation and asking questions and um my mom was asking a different worker than the one that i had asked 
uh, for an answer to my question about why weren't my friends going to go to heaven. Okay. And that worker said, well, we can't guarantee their salvation. And I remember just being so perplexed by that. Can they um, guarantee their salvation? That's the question I wanted to ask. Yeah. But, um, and I mean, but now, I mean, like I told you on the phone, um, having been in meeting and then getting out of meeting and having a lot of really good conversation with people that are questioning their thoughts and and the doctrine behind what they what they're being taught. I mean, and then I was actually a, a pastor at a church outside of meeting, so the the gospel, whenever it actually opened up outside of the uh, the teaching that we had experienced our whole life, um, was real. It was really powerful to to get to experience some of that. Yeah. Yeah, you did mention that, and we'll get into that a little bit more okay. um, down when we get to that part. So uh, so your mom had some questions for the workers, and she didn't feel like she got the answers either then. No, but. she really didn't. Um, and to be honest, she, I, 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 love, I love the way she tells this story, so I'm going to recreate what okay. she said. Um, she said that whenever she started encountering the Word for herself, everything opened up. Yeah, and, um, and and by and, that you mean not just relying on what you hear at gospel meetings exactly. from yeah. workers, yeah, exactly, and not just getting a a um, I don't want to say spoon fed. That's not really necessarily the right terminology that I'm looking for, but yeah, to get a King James v- Bible view, yeah, that's taught to you by somebody else. Like that's a that's two really strong filters that are going to influence the the way that you that you take in and process yeah. the word. Yeah. This gate sometimes has some trouble working, so we may be here for a second. Ah, oh, yes. Perfect. First time. First time, man. So this place that we're going out to, it's really beautiful. Um, I, this is kind of a side note, sorry. But um, I call them my in-laws. They're not actually my in-laws. Okay. Um, my, my wife's, her relationship with her parents is kind of challenging. So these people here that own this place have really stepped in in that parent role for her okay and so i ask them can can we come out here and and use their property to have this conversation of course they're not here right now they're both in georgia okay um but they were both really obviously okay with it um but yeah this is beautiful but anyway sorry continue with our conversation here okay let's see we were talking about um how your mom yeah yeah not yeah, spoon fed is it is a good it's a somewhat legitimate analogy. And there's some alpacas or something, huh? Well, yeah, alpacas. Yeah. They've got all kinds of animals out here. Um but yeah, just not relying on other people because I think sure. that's all what we did. Pretty much we just assumed that everything um was going to be given to us from the workers. And exactly, absolutely. Because of that, then we didn't have to read for ourselves so much. We didn't yep. have to study as much. And so when she started doing that, that's when she kind of saw. Well, and like, I'll say this, like, my, my, I get asked this question a lot because a lot of people think that like having been in meeting and come out of meeting, we would have kind of like a an adversarial stance toward it. Yeah. I don't have an adversarial stance towards the people. Yeah. But the theology sure. behind the, the, yep. the doctrine is what I have a, a kind of a problem with. Because, like, for example, my wife and I, when, shortly after we got married, um, my father-in-law, he is a uh, traditional Church of Christ. Okay. And my wife got a tattoo. And he went to telling me that I was a bad spiritual leader in my home. And that I wasn't leading my wife the right way, and that because she got a tattoo, yeah. and I said, "Okay, why do you feel that way?" And this kind of lit a fire in me because this is basically what we're here to talk mm-hmm. about. This was a, a stance that he had because of a culture, not because of of, of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so we started talking about it, and he said, "Well, the Bible says you're not supposed to do that." And I said, "Okay, where?" Mm-hmm. And he couldn't tell me. Yeah. And man, that was such a powerful moment because I'm like. Now I get it because I see it in someone else. I knew it, it was there in me that I had an idea of who God was because of what I, what I was taught as a child. Mm-hmm. But the idea that I was taught about who God was is completely counter to who God actually is. Mm-hmm. So anyway, yeah. let's go inside. We'll keep talking. They've got two dogs here. The, okay. dog, the dogs are pretty cool. 
you won't have any issues with them. All right. Their names are Kestis and Tano. <laughs> okay. They're wild, but they're awesome. All right, let's see, where would we leave off? We were talking about... Talking about my mom. Oh, and then uh, uh, talking to your father-in-law. Yep. And, and the, the spoon-fed between... version of the Bible. Yeah, the difference between head knowledge and actually and heart knowledge of Christ. Yeah. 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 So what did your dad think when your mom left? Did he like, was there any, like, what, what was that? Did he have any uh, cares about that or? Ultimately, I think my dad was on board with the decision. Yeah. Because um, I remember multiple times of my mom and dad having disagreements because when the workers were coming, we had to put the TV away. We had to eat in the di in the formal dining room. Yeah. Like we had to do all, make all kinds of different decisions because the workers were here. Uh -huh. And and then that combined with the fact that my dad wasn't allowed to participate in meeting um, because he wasn't he wasn't saved yeah. or he wasn't part he didn't of profess. it. Or, yeah, didn't profess. Yeah. And um, so I think my dad was ultimately on board with the decision to leave because um, he had some pretty. Uh, interesting experiences um, with some stuff that we can get into, um, just negative experiences with the workers. What was the final straw for your mom? When did, and how did that play out? Did she tell the workers you were gone or did you just yeah. not go anymore? No, she, she, told, she told the workers um, and it was, to say explosive, it was it wasn't like an outwardly explosive, mm -hmm. but like we lost everybody. Yeah, uh, like our entire community was gone mm -hmm. in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> yeah, and, and people people treated. I remember people treated us like like we had professed Satanism instead of just saying, "Hey, we just don't think this is what Jesus would actually want us to be living." Yeah, like and we I think, got treated very <laughs> negatively by I, some. I think that's very common yeah. like uh, and it's unfortunate because when you went did you know anybody who had left like not at the time or? no okay. not at the time okay um since then um i've had i've met a lot of people that have left and but, had some good conversations yeah, yeah. But, but when you were a child you just assume that if somebody did leave it was because of worldly reasons or yep. like whatever it's because they were choosing something other than god yeah yeah, yeah. so then um all those relationships just just gone and it's not that <clears throat> like for me it wasn't that they wouldn't some of them wouldn't talk to me at all yeah but some might but nobody did i mean i had maybe one or two people reach out to me after i left yep and man and, and even so we left like i said i was a teenager so i graduated i graduated high school in 2013 so it would have been probably at least 13 to 15 years ago that we left and last year in 2023 I went to a funeral of a individual that had been professing mm -hmm. their this individual's entire life and multiple times we would see somebody start to walk across the room towards us realize who we were my mom and I realize who we were and turn around and walk the other direction isn't that crazy I it's so crazy and I'm I, like dude I love people like yeah and I and and like like I told you on the in the car on the way over here, I don't I don't have anything against the people of mm -hmm. that still go because like I said the majority of my extended family still goes, mm -hmm. um, and, and some some relationships that are very nostalgic for me because mm -hmm. I, I mean we spent time in a convention yeah. you did and, everything together yeah yeah and so some of these people I loved getting to see yeah and some of the people that I would have loved to get to see were some of the ones that walked halfway across the room and turned out yeah. and walked the other way. Yeah, I didn't even know that that was possible until we experienced that after we left at my at my grandma's funeral, and then also um, just in the grocery store or something. Like yep. they literally would just turn around and walk. It's just crazy. Yeah, I, I remember we checked out uh, next to a guy in Walmart. I think it was, or I don't know, some grocery store, and he was checking out uh, next to us. And like I tried to like I didn't, I wasn't like hey you know, but yeah. I. I tried to see if he would notice and wave and say hi or whatever. He, he just like nothing. Yep. It's crazy. Yeah. And, 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 and that is such a, 
a manifestation of that culture um, because, and, and I was having, at breakfast this morning actually, we were having a conversation about how it's amazing how people can take pieces of the Bible and, and, and use that to support literally any narrative mm-hmm. that you want. Yeah. And just the, cult, the, the strength of which that culture has been ingrained in people of like, hey, they're not considered one of the friends, they're not part of the truth, like all of the words that they use, the euphemisms, it's just so amazing that like I, we have been gone over 10 years mm-hmm. and we're still some people are like I don't want to come in contact yeah. with you. Yeah. It's amazing. So when you guys how old were you when you left? I was trying to figure it out so I think I was 14. Oh okay. Yeah, 14 okay. or 15. I mean, I remember I was old enough to distinctly remember the lead up to and the aftermath. Okay. So So what happened next after you left? So, (laughs) um, it was kind of weird. Like I said, I was really mad at my mom, um, Mm -hmm. because I I think I had been indoctrinated enough to be mad at my mom that like, where are we, where are we going to go to church? Where where are we going to go to meeting? Like, how are we going to, how are we going to learn about God? And when you are instilled with, you have to go to meeting and not miss any, you know, you're going to go to hell if you do, if you missed enough. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, that would have been really tough. Yeah, it was. I remember being, I mean, I remember being really upset. Um, so we, thankfully, my mom took it slow, um, bringing us into something else. Um, okay. We started going to a Baptist church and a, a Southern Baptist church, man. So like, yeah. it was like old school Baptist. And um, yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> um, <laughs> Probably very different well it was very different but it was also really similar because there was a lot of legalism yeah um a lot of um older tradition um now the worship experience was completely different Mm -hmm. in a good way yeah um and it was something that we didn't really had never been really experienced to uh or exposed to excuse me um and then so we started going to a baptist church um realized that that wasn't going to work out I actually started going to an Assemblies of God church, which was the opposite end of the theological mm-hmm. spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went through a time, and, and look, in, in hindsight, I believe it's because I didn't really know what the Bible was. Well, you probably didn't have much foundation when you left. I didn't. You just, you just knew, your mom knew that the theology and the doctrine in meetings was wrong. Yep. And that's what... It, what it sounds like and that's why you left but you didn't necessarily have a foundation at that time no I didn't and because of that I went through a time of not caring about mm-hmm. God at all <laughs> and and not caring about living a, a, a the right life mm-hmm. um, and I, I think that's because I didn't have that foundation coming out of it because we just didn't get it like, yeah we got King James Version Bible and as a teenager, I didn't know the difference between thee and thou, yeah. you know, but that's all I ever heard. Yeah. So I had literally not heard, I mean, I should say this kind of, I have to explain this in kind of a different way. I had literally not heard an understandable version of the gospel my entire life up to this point. And that was because, I mean, and I think that's the reason why when I was 19, I just fell off the deep end yeah. <laughs> and um, had to had to learn who God was. Um, well, from square one. The gospel isn't re- preached in meetings. No. You know, so you no. don't have that foundation. And no. even if, I guess, in your words, what does the gospel mean to people that go to meetings? So I've had some really interesting conversations about this lately. And um, I went to this funeral that, of this individual and the workers that, that, that spoke at the funeral, mm-hmm. they, the, the, the gist of their message was basically, if we all try hard enough, maybe one day, if we're lucky, we can make it to heaven too. And they were they were congratulating this individual that had, had passed away, saying that they had had made it to heaven, and then if we all work hard enough, we can get there too. So they actually um, assumed that that person was going to heaven. That was the they didn't come out and say it, yeah. but it was it. And, yeah. and the individual that had passed away, there was no question. Like there was, there was no way to question it. Um, yeah. So they didn't, they didn't discount it by sure. any means. And I, and I've heard them, I've heard them do that before, where yeah. they're they're pretty sure that a person didn't make it to heaven. Yeah. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, <laughs> it's almost like 
the the gospel to people that are in meeting that I've heard uh, had conversations with, and I remember feeling this way myself, is if we just try hard enough to not upset God, we'll get to heaven. And if we try hard enough not to get in trouble, maybe He'll let us through. You know what I mean? And it's like almost like you're sitting at dinner with your mom, and your mom says, "Hey, you eat all your broccoli, you can have a dessert. But if you don't eat all your yeah. broccoli, and the the flip side of that is is Paul says very clearly, if righteousness can be obtained through works, then Christ died for nothing. Yeah. And like that is as point blank as I can as yeah. I can respond to people that are are, are dealing with this work based mm-hmm. theology that, that meeting is really teaching. I mean, he doesn't say if righteousness can be obtained through wearing a dress and not having a hair below your shoulders. Mm-hmm. Like he says, if righteousness can be obtained through works, then Christ died for nothing. And, and I think that's the, the simplest way to answer that mm-hmm. kind of in a, in a different way. Yeah. So. All right. So then you guys left and you started going to some different churches Yeah. in meetings. The, the term church shopping yeah. is like really bad. <laughs> like it's, yeah. see, they, they can't find the true way. They're just trying to, you know, go around finding whatever's, the most pleasing to them or whatever. Yeah. But it is, it is a legitimate thing. Uh, There's so many different churches and denominations out there that you have to, especially when you question everything from where we come out of, you do have to determine and and have discernment of if they're preaching the word and if it's what they're doing is biblical. So absolutely. uh, So you did a bit of that after you left. Yeah, absolutely. um, I mean, I think I had probably a, I don't know, five to seven year gap okay. of not caring. Sure. Um, and then when I hit 20 and 21 and 22, uh, all the way up to now, um, is when I, I really developed that that foundation that I didn't get as a child, if that makes sense. I mean, So you had left, graduated, left the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so where did you get that foundation? How did that play out? Uh, so it's kind of one of those things, like it's part, a big part of my testimony. Um, I made a lot of unhealthy decisions and then I came to a point where I actually went to church with my parents, um, for the first time in a while. So your parents started going to the same church? Yeah. So they went to the Baptist church and then when I started going to the AG church, they went to a, a uh, non-denominational church that they still attend today okay. Okay. Um, up in Red River. Okay. And um, so the, the church is just a phenomenal, phenomenal church um, that they go to. Um, really, really powerful people, really awesome people, really just loving people. So, yeah, they, they started going to the other church, and uh, I went with them. And I remember distinctly just feeling that impression of the Holy Spirit. And, and I, I just walked up at the end of the, at the church and I, I sat down with this old man named Wayne and I said, man, I'm broken and I have no idea how to fix it. And from that moment, it was like God just started opening, open up the floodgates for me, man. I mean, so you, you came to the point in your life where you're, you were willing to just put it all on the table. Yeah. I didn't have anything. Else. I need help. Yeah. I yeah. didn't have anything else. And you have to get to that point. Yeah. And it's really hard sometimes. It is, man. And I, that's the scary thing about this. Like, the, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of turmoil in meeting right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a conversation about it last week of these people are either that are leaving are either walking away from God entirely or sticking in this spot of being stuck in the middle and not really knowing which direction mm-hmm. to go mm-hmm. because when you yank that rug of culture out from underneath somebody they don't really know what way is up yeah so at, at, at one point yeah that's that's a really good point and that's really kind of why I started doing these interviews is because uh, when you don't have a foundation on Christ you just don't have any foundation you don't have a and way to so, go yeah. and then um, I had I won't say who it is, but I had somebody ask me one time, they stopped going to meetings kind of not publicly. They just kind of slowly, gradually stopped. And um, he just asked me, he's like, well, so you don't have to go to church to be saved, right? I was like, well, yeah, that is true. That's You're not saved true. by going to church. Yeah. And that was just enough for him, which 
it's a little, it's sad because there's so much more to life yeah. than just not going to church. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, but there's so many out there's there's so many out there that yeah do get angry because they equate meetings to God yep. and so they're angry at God because they don't know any better. Yep. And um, but yeah, so I want to show people that there is life after meeting and that the majority I would say of people who leave don't leave just to go get a well I guess you had a TV but yeah no go it, to get a TV <laughs> and uh, go be worldly you know go yeah. whatever. Well and like. I heard a I heard a, a reel on Instagram the other day, and, I, and I'm not a big Instagram person, but I think this summed it up well. Um, he said this this guy he's a rock singer. He's not a he doesn't profess to be a Christian. Okay. Nothing like that. But someone asked him a question okay. about what his thoughts were on Jesus. Okay. And he said the biggest problem with the church in America today is that we have turned Jesus into somebody that he's not. And I think that sums up the meeting theology completely amen we turn some we turn jesus into somebody that he he's not and he never yeah. was yeah and in addition to that i think that bad stuff happens when we stop talking to each other and while i don't agree with everything i don't really agree with much at all that is at the core values of what gets taught by the workers however i do think bad stuff happens when we stop talking to each other and i think that jesus while he turned tables over because of being upset he engaged with people that disagreed with him mm -hmm. because that's what grace looks like. Mm -hmm. And so, man, I think that it's really awesome that you're having these conversations because people don't realize, like, it's either you fit the culture or you're out. Mm -hmm. And we've turned Jesus into somebody that said, into a, a person that, that looks at, like, you're worried he's going to smack you with a big stick. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't want to, when we get out of that, out of that mold that meeting can put us in, it's really hard to approach Jesus again because we think we've upset him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because of the ingrained, ingrained culture. Yeah. And not only that, but I think, you know, they obviously have an, a non-biblical view of who Jesus is yeah. to begin with. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. I listened to a really interesting podcast and... It was a lady from Australia, and she was talking about the roots of the church, okay. the, the meeting in Australia. And she went really deep into the historical like beginning of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the, the main problem with meeting is a problem that happens in churches all over the country and all over the world. We, there's a group of people that get together and decide that this is what they want to, be, want to happen, what they want to see, and then they figure out how they can make the Bible mm -hmm. motivate people to follow what they want them to follow. Yeah, they fit the Bible into their belief. Exactly, yeah. and that creates a culture that is perpetuated for years mm -hmm. and decades. And some of the people now that are living in that culture don't even know where it came from. Yeah. And, they, and because of that, they think, well, this is what the Bible says. Yeah. And it's not what the Bible says, it's what a group of people a long time ago decided the Bible said. Yeah, exactly. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I was talking to, I had an interview yesterday uh, with a guy in Oklahoma City, and um, he, he had just said, you know, that, or we talked about how vague, like, oh yeah, we, if somebody were to ask us what we believe, or yeah. what church we go to, we'd just be like, well, it's just like the, the Bible says. And we kept it so vague, like, oh, we meet in homes and our ministers go out in pairs, just like the Bible. Yeah. We kept it so vague that you could hardly, unless somebody actually wanted to question that and get into a little bit more detail, they're just like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know? And they would just, it's, a, it's vague enough just to make them be quiet and then you can move on with your life. Yeah. But. Well, and I think that, I think that that's, unfortunately... I think that that's kind of the the ministerial approach that some workers have is we just need to give this person enough of an answer to their question to make them stop mm -hmm. asking questions. Exactly. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I have, I, I've got to sit with some people that recently that are going through some really hard times and that have spent their entire life in meeting. And this isn't a family member of mine or anything. This is some people that I know from New Mexico. And it was really interesting to just be like, hey, God wants to just sit with you and, and, and suffer with you because he's there. And, and they were, that was a foreign concept to them. Mm -hmm. 
And but I think it's because we don't the the workers don't teach who Jesus is. They think they teach who they think that Jesus wants us to be, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it's so beautiful whenever the, that picture gets flipped. Yeah. So let's go into a little bit of details about that on the theology side. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I've been I've been out. I left meetings in 2013, so it's been about 11 years. Is that similar to? I guess it'd be similar to. Ish. Yeah. And so I don't really know who they think Jesus is. Yeah. Marty and I are doing a podcast on that topic, and I always come back to, like, because I had no idea, you know. So who, who is Jesus to the friends and workers? Man, that's a really good question um, because I think that there are some, like, I remember some workers um, that <laughs> were just so loving and had a pastor's heart. Um, like, our, I mean, Ruth was a sister worker that I remember coming when, when we were kids, and she's amazing. And Jim Price, he's amazing. And, I mean, I've had multiple lunches and conversations with Jim um, since we left meeting. And the dude didn't really care about what church I went to. He just cared about my heart. Yeah. And so I think that type of person knows who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think those people knew who Jesus is, but I don't, I mean, I, I think you make a really good point when you say, I don't really think some people even really know. So it's hard for me to answer that question of who is he to some of them, because I don't think they know. Yeah. I don't think they haven't been really truly exposed to who Jesus actually is because I, I, I wasn't, mm -hmm. I didn't really experience that answer until I was in my twenties. And it doesn't really matter in the, the group. Yeah, that's that's really because weird. Yeah. <clears throat> because if you have a work based, and by that we mean appearances and following the unwritten rules of meetings, if you have a work a work based way of salvation, Jesus doesn't really matter. No, and I mean, but neither does grace and mm -hmm. all these. I mean, it's all the truth. Yeah. And what is the truth? Yep. Sorry the. Their barn people are driving by. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's just, that's a really powerful point because I think the idea of Jesus has been twisted to use him as kind of the enforcer to, yeah. to enforce that culture. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so let's fast forward to you went to church with your parents. I did, yeah. And then... Um, that's where you found the true biblical Jesus. Yeah. And then what happened next? So I moved to Texas in 2017. And uh, <laughs> so this is so weird. Um, moved to Texas in 2017. Um, up until that point, I had wanted to be a cop my entire life, a police okay. officer. Since I was five years old, I wanted to be chasing bad guys. And... I, there was some stuff that happened to me as a child that I think motivated some of that, but as far back as I could remember, I wanted to be a cop. Then I get to Texas and start engaging with the church here in Amarillo, and I get start these these guys start coming to me and they're like, "Man, you love people, you love the Bible. Like, I I think you need. I think God's more got a ministry type calling, if you will, to use a church word on your life." So I started kind of praying about that and exploring that, and then I ended up applying for an internship at the church that I was going to at the time. Okay. Um, I was rejected three different times, <laughs> so I went back to police work. I was like, yeah, well, I guess those people didn't know what they were talking about or <laughs> okay. whatever. So um, I went back to police work. I did a couple years as a cop here in Texas, and then um, had a good friend of mine, still a good friend of mine to this day. Um, he's a pastor. He said, dude, you need to apply one more time. And so I applied, and I got it. And then COVID happened. Okay. And in March of 2020, um, Lindsay and I, my wife Lindsay and I, we moved back to Amarillo to um, take the internship and start. And about a week after we moved back to Amarillo, I got a phone call, said, hey, money's, money's drying up. We're having to shut the church down, all this other stuff that COVID did to everybody. Uh, we have to rescind your offer. We're suspending the program this year. So I'm stuck. I didn't have a job. So you moved here. I moved here. Quit to, your job, moved yep, here. Yep. I quit my job as a police officer. I had 
like the most essential of essential jobs through would which would have been through COVID. Mm -hmm. um, had really good benefits. Um, had a house that we really didn't pay much for. Uh, I had a good pandemic proof spot, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I left it right before the pandemic started. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're, we're going through the pandemic, and a friend of mine comes to me, and he's like, "Hey, uh, we're we're kind of allowed to be around people again." Um, we want to bring you in for an internship, just you, and it won't be paid or anything, but we want to, we want to pour into you because we believe that you're gifted. And so started doing that. I did that for about two years, um, working another job and, and doing ministry on the side. And then, uh, I had a church, Lindsay and I started going to a different church. We, we didn't really like change churches per se, but we just were like, Hey, we just want to see what else is out there. And weren't upset, no negativity, nothing like that. We just wanted to experience mm -hmm. something else. And um, the church that we had been kind of working for uh, was a mega church, so there's 15,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were kind of like, we want to try something smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so we went out there, went to a different church here in the Amarillo area, and got hired to be their youth pastor. I mean, they it was, it was pretty quick. And so... We did that for a while um, and got out, got done doing that in uh, December of 2023, um, right before the turn of the or the first of the year, and um, just just love people, man, and and got to really have some really interesting experiences and some interesting conversations through getting to tell people like, hey, this is what my history is when mm -hmm. it comes to Jesus and comes to church, and 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 this is what. This is what I learned through that. This is what God did in me through that. And I think that God, um, He equipped me with a, a heart for people that are, that are stuck. Um, because the, the meeting word that gets used a lot is lost people. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's lost. I think some people are confused, but I don't think anybody's lost. Um, because, I mean, it says Jesus left the 99 to go chase the one. Like, He knows where all of us are. Mm -hmm. And so... Just getting to getting to do that and have some really interesting conversations based on my history mm -hmm. um, has been really, really, really awesome. And getting to getting to share some of what we went through and what I mean, you can totally relate with. Yeah, so. that's good. And a lot of people can relate um, because it's we're all humans, right? Yeah. So we have we have a common um, background, but a lot of people can relate that have a different legalistic background yep. too. Yep. So I guess we kind of skipped, I asked you what people that go to meetings think, or who people, who Jesus is, people that go to meetings, who Jesus is. So why don't we tell them who Jesus is? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, man, I think the best way to answer who Jesus is is to talk about what Jesus does, um, if that makes sense. And um, like t I talked about the video that I had seen, uh, and this is going to be a long answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can talk about this all day. Um, the video that I had seen, he was talking about his wife, and his wife was an adult film actress. Okay. Which is, I was like, ah, don't bring that up. But he said, the funny part is that if my wife was, and this is what this guy said on this video, he said, if my wife was to walk into a church in America now, she would be judged because of who she is. But you read in the Bible that my wife is the person that Jesus would have sought out. And tell and told her who she actually is, not what she has allowed herself to be defined by. And man, I think that I mean to say who Jesus is and what Jesus does, like just grace and love, man. Like that's the biggest two things, and that's the biggest two things that I think are missing in the theology of of meeting. Is Jesus wants to be with the people that we don't want to be with, mm -hmm. and because of that, we should want to be with the people that nobody wants to be with. Yeah, it's hard because it's contrary to the Pharisee nature. <laughs> oh, right? absolutely. You know, we're yeah. we're better than everybody else because we're we know the true way and and whatever. Um, one of the things that for me, like well, when can I can go I ahead. say something to go that? Ahead. Yeah, because the the thing that's always amazed me is we've been told that for our whole life of we know the true way and we we know we're the one only ones going to heaven and stuff like. Why don't we try to bring more people with us? Like the evangelistic arm of meeting is not really there. It's not there at all. Yeah, and and that's that's interesting to me is why are we content with just this group going to heaven? Yeah, and why 
if we say that we're the only way, why is there not more of an outreach? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, I noticed that. I remember, so I went to, we had been out for probably, I don't know, three or four years, and I went to a convention. Um, just wanted to spend some time around people that I love. Yeah. And I remember sitting there, and they tested the meeting, and I'm looking around. Nobody's standing up. They're singing this song. Nobody stands up. And I thought about it, and I'm like, man, with the message that that guy gave right before he, te he said, if you want to devote your life to Christ, like, we add more list of requirements to, to living a, a, a Christ-centered life. We just keep adding to this list, and it keeps growing, and people just are like, yeah, I'm not picking that up. And it's always been amazing to me because you, you make a good point. We think we're, or we don't, but the theology is that we're better than others because we know the true way. Mm -hmm. And I'm always, that's just always been a huge question of why, and I know I'm kind of rambling, I'm sorry, this is just kind of tr busted loose a rabbit trail for me. Why is there not more of an outreach? Why don't we yeah. want to take more people with us? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question I don't have an answer to. Um, I don't think... I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were workers that don't have an answer to that. Yeah. But, sorry. <laughs> oh, no. That's I totally good. bumped it's you good. off their path, man. I'm this sorry. Is, um, this is non-scripted, and it, we've always, I've always done it that way because I just want to talk about whatever. So. Yeah, talk about God. But I was just, I was going to say that when I, when we left, I don't know when this was, several years ago. Let's see, this would have been probably six years ago. Um we hit the road and went and did some ministry work, volunteered at some different church camps and stuff like that. And I had, you know, we'd gone to a number of different churches since we had left, but that trip in particular opened up my eyes to like the people we would think are so awful, like all tattooed up and maybe <laughs> yeah. there's one girl with like pink or purple hair, like just bright and like piercings all over and stuff. They were, volunteering and they were yep. talking about the bible you yep. know it was just so contrary yep. to how we grew up it's um, all about the image man yeah like, and and that's what i don't understand because like I, my wife and i used to be part of a, a leadership team for a, an addiction recovery ministry okay and that talk about people that wouldn't fit the mold yeah like so this guy comes in one night and we're talking to him he's an older guy real buffed up dude tattoos all over him and I mean, I, I'll make friends with anybody. Like, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make friends with that fence post over there, and we'll have a good conversation. Like, and so we sit down, and we're talking, and, and he's telling me, and, and I'm like, so you just got out of jail? And he's like, yeah, yeah. But now, I was like, well, how long were you in? He said, 17 years. I was like, dang, man. Well, what did you do? He goes, well, I tried to kill a police officer. He said, I ran him over with my truck, and I drug him for almost a mile. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> And that would do it, wouldn't it? Yeah, and I said, well, that would send you to jail. And he goes, we start talking, and he finds out later that I used to be a police officer. And, and he goes, man, somebody, a cop would not sit and talk to me because I tried to kill a cop. And I said, well, Jesus would. So mm -hmm. I am. And I think <laughs> that's who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? And I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I'm on a soapbox right now. But, like. Why don't we get that? Why don't we see that? Yeah. So, sorry, continue with your questioning. Yeah. <laughs> I'm steering you all over the road, no, man. Good. I'm keeping you on your toes. You're good. But So, on a, on a biblical note of who Jesus is, you know, generally he's always, yeah, he died on the cross for us, but yeah. that didn't, like, that's important, but it's more important to follow the rules. Yeah. Um, so, how was that coming out of, you know, learning all of these different biblical things it's not even like i guess what they would call a worldly church but you're learning all of these biblical things how did it feel like when your eyes were open to that really good um so you kind of you know how like you sometimes when you're underwater and you're too far underwater but you so you're trying to get to the top and right when you bust through and you get that first breath of fresh air it's like the best feeling you know mm -hmm. like you're like wow i didn't just die <laughs> like but to feel that oxygen come into your brain and the clarity to come back and yeah. the, um, the sense of panic to go away. Um, because whenever, 
I mean, and I, and I know people listening to this are, are probably kind of in that that some some people might be in that limbo stage that we talked about before of not really knowing which way is up. And man, whenever you whenever you experience that moment of busting through that surface and 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 getting that first breath of fresh air of, of who Jesus actually is, like there is no better feeling, and yeah. there is no better um, no better uh, feeling of peace that you feel knowing that you don't have to do anything to accomplish what God has for you. Mm-hmm. God has it there. Salvation is a free gift. The The sacrifice on the cross was a free gift. Like, that is such a relief when you come out of, well, if I don't take communion and I don't have something to take part in meeting and I don't, my, my wife doesn't wear a dress with her hair above her shoulders and all that type of stuff. Like, when you realize that it's not about that, it's such a liberating feeling. Yeah. Okay, so you had brought that up twice, hair above the shoulders. Was that kind of like a thing? Oh, like, yeah. No, I, I remember hearing that a lot. Okay. Of that so was it could be down as long as it, or I guess, so that would just mean it's not down at all. Yeah, we were told it yeah. couldn't, I mean, we always were told that it had to be above your shoulders. Hmm. I don't know why, but like I remember at, at, at uh, convention, like, playing basketball with girls in dresses in the jean dresses mm-hmm. that drug on the ground when they walked yeah you know and so yeah that's that's where that comes from yeah i think that this is a really critical time to be having conversations like this because yeah. w- i mean with all the the turmoil and the the stuff going on with the everything i mean we can list all the negative stuff but like like I said earlier, bad stuff happens when we stop talking to each other. But also, there, there's a, a heightened sense of responsibility for those of us that have made it through mm-hmm. and we have found that foundation. We need to be speaking back to the people that are still coming up to say, like, this is where we, this is where God, this is what God has for you. Yeah. We need to communicate that because what what I'm what I hate to see and what we're seeing a lot of is people that were um, a, C- a victim of the CSA stuff that is going on mm-hmm. right now, um, or a victim of just the church mm-hmm. <laughs> and and the culture and the and the ostrac- ostracizing and the the all of that. Um, when when those when those people are victimized, they're walking away from God completely. Yeah, and we need to do everything we can to stop that. Yeah, it, a couple. I have a question for you, but a, a point on that one. I, we had a. I remember as a child when the workers would say, "It's better for somebody to not go to any church if they leave meetings, just to go be worldly, than it would be to go to another church." And that is just wow. <laughs> and, and I don't understand we that cannot, at all. Well, we can from this. I think I can understand it now that. If they go to another church, they might find out the truth. Yeah, and then they'd be like you and I and speak up about it. Yeah, yeah. And so that's that's probably the underlying reason, I would say. Yeah. Okay, so my question is, it's important to, to talk, like you said, to talk to people who still go to meetings. Um, how do you do that when so often, and for myself, my wife says I was a brick wall. <laughs> how do you do that when they're so often closed off? How do you approach that? So that's hard. Um, I, I find a lot of success in, in, in using the word help me or the phrase help me understand. Okay. Um, because I, I want to have conversations with people that disagree with me, but I also want to have conversations with people that don't really know what they believe completely. And whenever I, I mean, and like I said, this is what I've had success with. This may not work in every situation. That's my disclaimer. But Man, it's 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 been really beneficial to sit down with some of these people that have been in meeting their entire life and they're struggling with stuff, and then you say, "Well, help me understand why you believe that way," mm-hmm. and then you, and that ultimately gets them to think, right? Yeah, it and does. What, it gets them to open up that can of worms of yeah. trying to explain to me why they feel the way that they do, mm-hmm. but it also they're explaining to themselves why they feel the way that they mm-hmm. do. And then that also eliminates the adversarial potentially tone of the conversation mm-hmm. and allows me to speak truth back into what they say. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's important for us to get them to question. Yeah. So, um, 
Because, I mean, that's the culture is don't question. Don't question. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting. The interview I did yesterday, he's like, well, why are, why are they afa- afraid of the truth? And, or why would you be afraid? If you have the true and perfect way, why would you be afraid to challenge that? Yep. But that is, it's so, like, I sent one of our uh, videos to somebody and they said, I'm not going to watch it because I don't know what's in it and I don't know the intent of it. <laughs> and it's like... That's called if, indoctrination, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, but the, it's so sad because if, if you're so firm in your faith that meetings is the true way, then maybe you aren't because you're afraid that it's going to change what you believe, right? Yeah. And that's scary. Yeah. It is scary. It is. There's a lot that I can say about that, but I don't think that, I mean, and this is just based on how I read the Bible. I don't think Jesus ever meant for us to be um, subjugated by anybody but him. You know what I mean? Like he is the king of kings. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, Whenever we get into the whole, why are they not? Why are they not questioning the truth? Why are they? Why are they afraid of people asking questions? I think it comes down to the workers have an element of control mm-hmm. with whenever people don't ask questions. I mean, they get. I mean, ultimately, they get financial benefit. I mean, they get just recognition mm-hmm. of. I mean, because I mean, I've I've stood on a platform and I've taught the the word of God. People listen. Mm-hmm. People trust you. And if you're not careful, that can develop an arrogance mm-hmm. in you because people listen to you and because people trust you. And whenever you like that feeling and you're not, and you're not holding yourself accountable to that feeling, there's no telling what you'll do to be able to keep it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good point. The workers do, especially the elder brother workers, do have a lot of control. I remember um, many times where there was a question asked at like a, a Bible study after breakfast at preps because mm-hmm. my parents live in the convention grounds. And like a lot of the questions just got shut down like that. Yep. Like it's just very, uh, well, we just, that was a different time. And, you know, I think one of the questions was, um, why do the workers not perform miracles still? <laughs> and the answer was, well, that was a different time for different, different people. And looking back at it, I don't know verbatim what the answer was, but it's essentially what it was. Looking back at it, I was like, yes, that was a different time <laughs> for different people, you know. But the the question just got shut down, and there was no conversation about it. So, Well, man, I remember a time when um, I was probably, I mean, I was young. I was probably 9, 10 years old, and I said, I told my mom I wanted to profess because I felt, I felt Jesus from an early age. And so we go and sit down with a brother worker. I won't tell you which one. You would probably know him if I told you. And he's still an elder brother worker. And I remember him telling me that I was not old enough to make that decision. And that was the end of that. And They have the final say. On whether or not I devote my life to Christ. Yeah. Yeah, which is like, what? Yeah. Like. But, and thinking about it now, I mean, of course I was upset then, but like, we were taught not to, not to question. So my mom even was like, okay, you're not old enough. Like, we'll try again in a couple years. Like, (laughs) I was eight, I think when I professed and I never, I guess I didn't ask him, but I just did it. Yeah. Uh, But I do remember when I was baptized, I asked my mom, am I too young to be baptized? Like it was, um, I don't know. There was, and also one thing that I, <clears throat> I don't quite understand is if, if you offer for the work, it can be a yes or no too. The same thing. It's like you have to submit an application process to. Yeah. Work, so if you feel called, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you feel called, if you sincerely feel called, there shouldn't be somebody telling you no. Yeah. Because it's not a calling, and they claim, uh, a lot of the workers claim to be apostles. Yeah. Um. And so if that's the case, the definition of an apostle would be to be called by 
well, there's more than this. Workers can't be apostles because if you look at uh, in Acts, the qualifications to be an apostle, they just can't. But anyways, yeah. but you have to be called by God. So they say that they're called by God, but yet the overseer is determining whether they can be a worker or not. Exactly. I mean, in, like, so, I mean, apostle is, is, is considered a spiritual gift. But the interesting thing is whenever you go back to why aren't the workers performing miracles and they say, well, the spiritual gifting was and the manifestation of that was a, for a different people at a different time. What get, my question is, what gives them the right to decide what spiritual gifts are still active and which mm-hmm. aren't? And that's what we see is they're saying, well, that doesn't apply now. Mm-hmm. But this gift that gives me the ability to tell you what to do, mm-hmm. that still does, and, yeah. I, and I and I'm and I have it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so that's just so interesting that you that you make that point because that, that just highlights the whole spoon fed gospel that we talked about on the way over. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. That's a a beautiful place for sure. Man, it's awesome. So for a while, my wife was coming out here and helping take care of horses and. Um, just getting to come out here in the morning. I came out here a few times with her. It's it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, but, man, this is such a heavy topic. It is. When I first started doing these interviews, I didn't realize at the end of the day I was so exhausted. Not like yeah. <laughs> necessarily physically exhausted, but Emotionally, just mentally yeah. and emotionally. In a good way. It's, sure. you know. Well, but, and it's a... I'm sorry. Are we'll you say, hot? No, we're gonna say hi to the llama. Oh, okay. Or, what did it? Where are they? Alpacas. Alpacas. Yeah. Right. That one's name is Obi. He doesn't want to look at us. <laughs> he may spit at you, so. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, that's Obi. We've got. They've got just those two. But. They're they're funny, man. When then when they get sheared, yeah. Oh, that fur! Like, have you ever seen alpaca fur clothing? Yeah, I. That stuff's expensive. It man. is. My neighbor had them when I was growing up. One of our neighbors had like dozens of them. Yeah. And so we were around them a little bit when I was a kid. Yeah. But. Man, it's uh, it's different because I was never around them as a kid. Yeah. We had like elk and deer and cows and. Mm-hmm really didn't even have horses but yeah it's good stuff yeah that's cool what other questions can i answer for you well what advice would you have for people who still go to meetings um man that's a simple answer um look for yourself dig into the bible get out of the king james version get out of the new king james version Find okay some- what first of all i've had some comments and I think King James only is a cult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could see because that. Because yeah, I could the see people that. that the people that adhered to that as being God's only true version of the Bible is is ignorant. But it's and I when I left, I did a ton of research on Bible translations. True. Yeah. Because I wanted a different translation. Um, and I wanted to not have a bad one, or yeah, because there is some bad ones out there. Absolutely, but yeah. you, go ahead and give me your. Um, so, you want my recommendation? Well, no. <laughs> well, you can give me your recommendation, but go into a little detail of why you say get out of the King James. Well, I mean, the, the simplest way to answer it is because it, it's hard. It's just hard to understand. Yeah. I mean, we don't we don't speak in that type of language anymore, and. Yeah, we do. We pray in that. We pray <laughs> well, in King James. You're or we right. Used to. <laughs> we shouldn't. But, um, but the interesting thing is the so the Old Testament is primarily translated from uh, Hebrew. Mm-hmm. The New Testament is primarily translated from Greek. Mm-hmm. Neither one of those translate very smoothly to English. So it's always a good practice to look at multiple translations. Yes. However, um, I don't think. A translation that was written when there was still kings and queens and that like that's probably not the best way for us to try and, and research the Bible yeah um, now does the new King James Version have some benefit 
A hundred percent, I I agree. But I, I think that for personal study, personal intake, I think it's safe and advisable to explore other options. Yeah, if that makes sense. And and I will add for those watching. I don't have anything wrong with the King James Version. Neither, it's, neither do it's, I. Yeah. It's actually a really good translation. It's just hard to understand because of the, the terminology from the time period that it was done. Exactly. I mean, uh, and, and like using words like, <laughs> for example, when I was teaching to one of my high school kids one time, I used the word boast. Yeah. He had no idea what that meant. Huh. And that's a King James, a simple yeah. King James word. Yeah. And so, man... I, I prefer, so I, I kind of use a cross-reference of three-ish, sometimes okay. a four. Um, I use the NLT, the New Living Translation. Okay. That's my primary Bible. Um, that's the Bible that I've taught out of. That's the Bible that I read. Is that more of a literal or a word-for-word uh, a word or a phrase-for-phrase? Phrase? A word-for-word. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more benefit in it. Um, I think, watch, now that I said that, it'll probably be different. But... <laughs> um, I use the NLT, the NIV, and the ESV. Um, sometimes I, I work with the NASB, the New American Standard. Um, I, I try to stay away from the message translation. Um, that one is very filtered um, to, to try and make it more relatable, which is good, well, but me- use it in connection with something else. The message was um, not really meant to be a translation. It wasn't it the guy that made it for his kids. Yeah. So <laughs> if you have that in mind, I I don't know that I've read much of it at all. Maybe when, you know, if I'm on um, a Bible website where they have them compared, sometimes they may pop up or whatever. But I don't know that it's, you know, it's not necessarily bad to read just to, yeah. but it's not like it's you know, not something that you want to hang your hat on. Yeah, for exactly. Sure. Yeah, because I mean, it never was really intended to be that. Yeah, and I, to my understanding, uh, uh, some people fall into reading that as their only Bible, and again, I don't have anything against it. I just I think that it's better to go with a more uh, specific translation if you're working on personal intake and, yeah. and studying for yourself. Yeah, I would agree. If that makes sense. So yeah, I mean that. And, and really dive into um, asking questions. Mm-hmm. Um, ask God the, for the strength to, to 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 challenge where you need to challenge, because some things need to be challenged, and and some things don't. But ask God for the courage to challenge the things that need to be challenged. Yeah. Um, because I think that especially when we come to um, generations and and what's going on and. Um, the only way we change a generation is by changing a generation. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. And the way we do that is through communication. And um, I think that's the biggest thing that, like, I, whenever you first reached out to me, I kind of bounced back and forth of, like, do I want to do this? Do I don't? Do I want to? Do I what? Like, is it bad? Is it good? And, mm-hmm. I, and I think that I can speak the truth with love. But I can also say that the biggest the biggest goal that I had in speaking to you today was we need to change a generation. Mm-hmm. And there are good things that, that happen within the bounds of meeting. There's also some things that need to be changed. Yeah. Um, and those, like you said, and I think it will come across, I mean, we love everybody who still goes to meetings. Oh, we absolutely. don't have any. And I'm thankful that, you know, I personally don't have any hard feelings for them. I was True. angry. Uh, or, Sure. After I left, I was like, the, I, I didn't realize I was angry, sure. but I was. Yeah. Um, but that's part of the grief process. And yeah, that, I mean, because natural. you lose your community. Yeah, and yeah. you lose your people, and you feel like you did something wrong. Yeah. And like I remember one time I was reading a Billy Graham book. Like <laughs> Billy Graham was like the Jesus of Jesus. You know, like that guy was a phenomenal pastor and phenomenal Bible teacher. And um, I was reading a, a Billy Graham book and someone told my mom that they were concerned about my future because of what I was reading. I, a book by Billy Graham. Yeah. I want to bring something up on that really quick. Um, one of the stories I heard as a kid, because they do a lot of stories that sure. support, try to support their beliefs. Yep. One of the stories was that one of the brother's workers actually met Billy Graham once. Yep. Have you heard this? No. Oh, okay. 
And they said, um, well, I shared the gospel with them or something. <laughs> and so they said that Billy Graham said, well, I don't care because I got all the people or something like that. <laughs> like it was wow. a way to... Um, just, just a way to try to act like you're right, probably. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or to, or to give credit to themselves. That, sure, you know. Man, well, it, or no, he said, he said, I know you're right, but I have all the people, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> unfortunate, man. I hate that. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. It's just, what would I say to people that are still in meeting? Like, I would say, I mean. The reason why we are where we are is we've allowed, allowed ourselves to be put on our own island. And in addition to what I've already said, just communication is good. Yeah. And the that's what has been tried to, what has been attempted to be stamped out for so many years is communication and, mm-hmm. and clarity of communication. Um, I'm giving you like the scenic tour of Canyon. Sorry. No, that's good. Um, and I, I, man, I think that that's just the biggest thing is we just need to communicate. That's why, yeah. that's why our country is where it is now. Um, we we quit talking to each other, um, and I think social media has oh yeah erased um, the culture of being normal. <laughs> what would you yeah. consider as normal? Well, and and it's erased the culture of healthy disagreement. Because yeah. if you post something on social media... That, you can just hide behind the screen. Yeah, and I mean, but the flip side is if you post something that's counter to the narrative, you're going to get torn apart, mm-hmm. which may happen when you post this video. Um, <laughs> uh, but, like, and because of that, it makes people scared to speak up. Yeah. And yeah. speak up with love because there's a different... And, like, my wife and I were talking about this with a situation with... Um, completely unrelated to this but um i said there's a difference between fairness and grace we can be Mm -hmm. we can have grace we don't necessarily have to be fair but we have to be and by fairness we're we're i I see that as uh considering and evaluating both sides and i'm not gonna change my viewpoint on this Mm -hmm. on this type of stuff but i am want i do want to and i will every opportunity that i get have a conversation where we can discuss God yeah. and what he does and who he is and discuss where we disagree mm-hmm. without having a major issue. Yeah. So, yeah, that's good. But what else you got for me, my friend? Well, I don't know. I think it was good. I think um, we touched a lot of good subjects. Yeah, I think a lot we of did. Good topics. It's, I love these types of conversations. So what do you do for work now? So I work for ADT uh, Security. Okay. Um, it's an alarm company. Uh, I've done that for about five years. Um, and we have, like I said, my wife and I have moved to Canyon uh, in 2021, I believe. Yeah, 2021, 2022, something like that. Okay. Um, and before that, we lived in Amarillo. So... 20 Not miles away. Yep. Yeah, we can get off these bumpy roads. Sorry. Yeah, well, I appreciate you your got. time. I appreciate your time and yeah. uh, willing to share a little bit of your story. And yeah. I know there's probably a lot more to what we can fit in a couple hours. <laughs> but, uh, but Well, man, I, I, like I said, it's we always have to have conversations. And I'm open to, to doing it again if you need me to do it again. And I'm open to having a conversation with anybody on this video. Um, yeah, if listening. somebody wants to reach out to you, yeah. um, do you want me to have them email me first, or do you want me to put your email in the description? Or? Yeah, I mean, either one. I mean, you can have them email you, or and you can okay. give them my phone number, I mean, or okay. they can email me directly. That's fine. Okay. Um, well, I'll get your email from you. You can message me, and then I'll put it in the description sure. so people can reach yeah. out to you. Yeah, I'd love to talk. Um, I, uh, I know that some people are probably not going to completely agree with everything that I've said today, but... I'd love to talk to those people too. So yeah, yeah. I think that's it's a common thread of a lot of us that have left. We're open and willing to talk, and uh, would love to talk with with people that still go to meetings and sure. Um, so yeah, that's great to keep that line of communication open, like you said. Yeah. Well, man, I appreciate you coming down and um, 
and getting to talk about this. I've, I've looked forward to it. Um, like I said, once I finally got my head around it, um, I've, I've very much looked forward to it. Yeah. So I'm glad we got to spend some time together. Thank you.